Hi, everybody. I'm Amanda Walsh, formerly Clayton. When I was here, I was Amanda Clayton. So. Um, and I'm in the first cohort of students, and we looked at whether or not we should use genetically modified mosquitoes to uh, try and control dengue fever. So I'm going to talk at a very high level about the product, the main product that we made from that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what factors led to our success, lessons learned, um, and then a tiny bit about how this program prepared me for the workforce. So uh, first we were asking, should we use genetically modified mosquitoes to control dengue? And um, this is all of our students, so Tim Antonelli, Tim Antonelli I added a Cool. is in biomath. I'm from economics. Uh, Molly Hartzog was from communication, rhetoric, and digital media. And Sophia Webster and Gabe Zilnick were from entomology. So a tiny bit about dengue fever. It is estimated to impact about 390 million people throughout the world, mostly in Central and South America, Southeast Asia, and Africa. Um, it produces symptoms similar to the flu. So you get fever, headache, rash. Um, they actually call it uh, quebranto huesos in Spanish, which means breakbone fever because it gives you these terrible body aches. Um, it's potentially fatal, though rarely so. Um, and it is treatable with IV fluid, though countries tend to have issues with providing as much treatment as is needed during epidemics. They get overwhelmed. So um, the mosquito that transmits the disease, it's primarily the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Uh, to a secondary extent, Aedes albopictus is also capable of transmitting it. Um, and it's only females that bite. They bite during the day, which is different than uh, the mosquitoes that spread malaria. They tend to bite at night. So that means that nets are not effective because you can't wear a net around your body all the time. And um, they lay eggs in open water containers, which again is slightly different from the malaria mosquito, which uh, lays their eggs in a raft on large bodies of water. These mosquitoes lay eggs on the edge of a container that then gets inundated with water. So if you think of wa water storage containers that are purposeful, also things like plant pots and little holes in trees, it becomes a very difficult issue to try and control all the potential spaces that could serve as breeding grounds. Um, and they primarily inhabit tropical urban areas. That's something else that's unique to this, is that it tends to be an urban issue rather than a rural issue. And so there are two primary large types of GM control techniques. One is population suppression, where you try and introduce an element that will reduce the population or eliminate the mosquito population. The other option is uh, population replacement, where you essentially try and replace the wild mosquitoes with genetically modified mosquitoes that are incapable of transmitting that disease. So um, as a group, we ended up making, originally we were tasked with writing a white paper on this. Um, we went through a lot of different iterations on what our paper was going to be, and we ended up with this modified decision tree. So basically trying to have a tool for policymakers or other stakeholders to decide, should we consider using this technology in our scenario? And so our first question is, is dengue a recognized problem in your area? recognizing that resources are limited. A lot of places have many issues. Is dengue a priority issue in that area? That's like ground one, right? If that's the case, then what are your current issues to controlling the disease? So again, treatment, simple, straightforward. It's basically IV fluid, but that can be very difficult for countries to administer at very large scales when needed. Um, Social issues, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then your current control program efficacy. So how are your natural or chemical or cultural types of control that you're doing working or not working? And could GM potentially solve any of those issues? So for social issues, you have to think all about regulation, community engagement, and ethics. We went into a lot of details on each of these things, but due to time, I'm not going to actually talk about this. But if you have any questions later, maybe we can talk more. Um, but so basically, we went through and discussed each of these issues in turn. And then the ultimate question was, do you use GM for dengue control or not? And uh, we were split on what we came up with, so we decided to go with the uh, the court methods of giving them two different opinions. <laughs> so 
one conclusion was not right now, um, and that that you should focus on treatment instead. That um, it GMM may not be better than current control methods. It may not be more effective, um, and regulation and support are not yet in place to make this viable necessarily. Granted, this was two years ago, so progress is being made every day, but. Um, and the potential risks of GM were not fully explored enough. The other side was yes, but only, big but only, um, with caution. So trying to do site-specific risk assessments for each decision of implementation. So you can't just say, yeah, we'll use it everywhere. Um, as part of a broader control strategy, so it should never be seen as a silver bullet, that that's the only type of control that you need, and then it's going to work perfect, and you can get rid of everything else that you do. Um, and on a case-by-case -case basis, so making sure that you have the communities in each area engaged and on board with what's happening to them and around them. So everyone agreed that um, research on these techniques should continue, and regardless of whether you want to use it for dengue control or not, um, there's implications for lots of other diseases that are mosquito-borne or other vector-borne potentially. Um, and that we need to maintain an open dialogue with all interested publics throughout the entire process. So um, bottom up rather than top down engagement. So not just figuring out that you can do it, figuring out with uh, maybe lawmakers that they'll let you do it, and then right before you're about to do it, oh hey, by the way, community, we're about to release some genetically modified mosquitoes into, oh, you're upset about that? Well, shoot, we've already spent a lot of money and time on this. <laughs> You know, so making sure that you are initiating that dialogue from the beginning at, and, and at every stage continually. Um, so a little bit about what this work led to for us. So we ended up with a chapter in um, the introductory chapter of this book edited by Zach Adelman on um, genetic control of malaria and dengue. So our chapter looked at these same t sort of issues that we made throughout the decision tree, um, but discussed for both dengue and malaria. So it got expanded and changed a little bit from, from what I just showed you. Um, and then we were also invited to present this work at the second annual conference of uh, governance of emerging technologies in Scottsdale, Arizona in 2016, 2014. That was a long time ago, man. So yeah, so those are our two main products that came out of our cohort's work on top of our individual dissertation chapters. So that came out backwards, that's okay. So some must-haves for maximizing success. So it's really important to have clear project aims, so understanding what your question is, but then also the type of product that you want to make and what your intended audience is going to be. This may sound really simple, but we spent probably an entire semester, if not more, <laughs> spinning around on what we were going to actually end up producing. Um, and then making sure that students and faculty all have the same idea of, of expectations and what's going to end up being the end product. And then having a clear plan of work. So project roles, determining student leadership. We actually ended up with a pretty good model that um, we shifted student leadership every couple months based on people's availability um, and to try and make sure that you had a variety of leadership models. Um, and that actually worked pretty well. Um, and then making sure that you understand we have students from a lot of different disciplines with very different requirements from year to year. So understanding how everyone's timelines are going to interact and try and distribute the work that way. Um, oh, this also came out backwards. That's all right. So, okay, so a little bit about me. So I currently work at RTI International, which is actually in the triangle here. So it's an independent uh, not-for-profit research institute, and we are dedicated to improving the human condition. Our, uh, our p little tagline is delivering the promise of science for global good. So um, there are many groups within RTI. I'm in the innovation economics group, and um, basically, Igert, when, when the job description for my current role came out, Igert had pretty much stamped my name on that, on that job. <laughs> it trained me perfectly for what I do. Um, so it taught me how to communicate across disciplines and across professional backgrounds. I continually work with people in government policy. Like I said, RTI is not 
a group of economists. They are people from many different social sciences and sciences disciplines. So I work across the spectrum on a regular basis. Um, and then I tackle very diverse projects on the impact of technological innovation. So I've worked on everything from a project on the Materials Genome Initiative for NIST, which is looking at having fundamental data on uh, materials properties to try and advance um, advanced materials produ production. Um, I've done projects on uh, innovations for medical research, biomedical research, and programs that are uh, working to enhance that. Um, and then I've done, you know, return on investment for technical training programs at community colleges. It's a, it's a really wide variety and cyber identity and cybersecurity projects. So um, IGERT gave me the confidence when I started the program as an economist and I found out I was going to have to learn about genetic engineering. That was extremely daunting. I said, I said that the first class that I took on our gen the genetic engineering class that they had us take, the first class I said it was like accidentally walking into an intermediate level German class <laughs> with no German experience. Like, I, I didn't even understand. I came up to Marseille at the end and I was like, so what's a gene? <laughs> what really is a gene? Let's start there. Um, and it gave me the confidence to learn that, that you, can, you can learn these things and um, if you're willing to engage in the different different types of communication you can get there so I found the IGER program to be very enriching and beneficial Great. Good. 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 Good.